Ah, the middle way here on a Monday morning. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech. The handsome young man <coughs> is Chang Wang. <laughs> We're going to talk about from here to there with immigration lawyer Susan Cohen. Welcome, Chang. Welcome, Susan. Nice to see you. Great to be here. Thank you. So, uh, Chang, can you uh, introduce Susan and uh, try to be fair about this? Because immigration lawyers, they get a bum, a bum rap these days. Everybody always says, there's no more immigration law. How come there are immigration lawyers? Good point. <laughs> well, it is my great honor and pleasure to introduce Susan. Uh, legendary nationally recognized lawyer i have the fortune to call a mentor and friend as chair of means of immigration practice and uh, to send call work with corporate clients and to address the constant immigration challenges Susan is very active in the american immigration lawyer association and contributed to federal and state immigration regulation it's frequently quoted by media He's an editor of Means Immigration Law Blog and recognized as top author of CD Supra. Very interestingly, you may know that Susan led a team of Means lawyers working with the ACLU of Massachusetts and to obtain a temporary receiving order ERO on the 2017 Trump travel ban. For her pro bono work, she has helped many immigrants but obtain asylum. And today we invite Susan to be on the show because she just published a book, an inspiring and a thought provoking book on immigration. The title is Journeys from There to Here Stories of Immigrant Files, Violence, and the Contribution. Receiving real reviews and short to help to the number one Amazon bestseller in a slew of different categories. I've read this book, and um, this report is a very, very good read. A famous writer was exiled from Albania and Greece. A Somali Norman turned multinational banker, an Asian born virtuoso violinist with perfect pitch, and many more. In this eye opening collection of immigrant files, Leading immigration lawyer Susan Cohen invite you to walk her clients and their share the incredible journey coming to America while overcoming unimaginable dangers and often heartbreaking obstacles abroad. Cohen massively uplifts marginalized voices, laying bare the remarkable realities of staggering hardship. And inspiring resilience. I see you read this book, right? Right. Up and okay. Down okay, down. Chang. We're gonna we're gonna use the whole show on the introduction. <laughs> uh, let, let's get to Susan. Uh, Susan, why did you become an immigration lawyer? Is it because you 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 you're empathetic with people? Uh, that you have a big heart? Is that what it is? Tell us. I guess it, uh, Jay. Uh, turns out that that seems to be the case because I didn't think that's what I was going to do with my life. I started out thinking that I was going to be a, a corporate litigator, and I joined my firm, Mintz Levin, which is a large corporate law firm in Boston, a wonderful place. I've been there my whole career, 36 years. But I started out doing litigation, and then I had an experience where I got to represent as a very junior associate, like a second year rising first to second year associate, an amazing Japanese potter who was doing his um, visa and residency at Harvard and at a very special museum called the Peabody Essex Museum. And this guy was here with his whole family and he carried on this tradition of pottery that was very unusual, seven generations. He was the seventh generation potter. His work was exquisite. I ended up being the lucky one to put his case together, got a green card for him and his family. And it was so incredibly meaningful to me. They were so grateful. Their life trajectory was changed for the better in a way that they had deeply wanted, but didn't know if it would come to pass. And we had a wonderful celebration and I felt so good about it that I changed course and decided to start an immigration practice at my law firm. So you that's know, that's so funny, Susan. 
my first immigration case also involved a Japanese potter who You're I'm kidding. friendly with even today. Ask your, ask your client if he knows Yukio Ozaki. That they uh, know each other. I guess well, they, they you know, do. I have, I have his case bound, velo bound on the bookshelf of my office because the very first immigration case I ever worked on. And I, I remind myself all the time that, you know, I was inspired and I love this work. I love helping people. And it's not easy. As, it's not, uh, no, it's, and it's hard these days. And my joke before we, you know, began is, is there still immigration law? law? I mean, I know some immigration lawyers here in Honolulu that swear there's nothing they can do anymore. Even in the day, even in the day of Biden, it's much harder to help people. Am I right? You are right. And there are reasons for that. Would you like me to talk about them? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I would be I would be delighted. And it's very nice to share this opportunity with you and your and your watchers today. I mean, I, it kind of wraps into why I wrote the book. So maybe I'll say a little bit about why I wrote the book. And then, you know, we'll, you know, it will lead us inexorably into the question of why is it so difficult today? So why did I write Journeys from There to Here? It wasn't like I'd ever, you know, really planned to write a book, right? I just was in the trenches every day helping my clients, like this wonderful gentleman in front of us. And, um, you know, putting in very long hours, as you as you probably know, because you are an immigration lawyer, so you know how hard it is, how long the hours are, and you're very tired at the end of the day. But then President Trump came along, he started campaigning, and uh, during his campaign and his presidency, President Trump unleashed the, the severe virulent xenophobia. You know, xenophobia in the United States rises and falls over the course of time and history. And during President Trump's era, um, he unleashed tremendous uh, hatred um, of immigrants and xen xenophobic rhetoric across the country. And he used his platform and he used his presidency once he became president to restrict immigration in the form of uh, approximately 400 standalone separate moves that he did as policy, regulations, the travel bans, and he um, used his bully pulpit, in my opinion, as a platform to spew a lot of exaggerations and generalizations and stereotypes about immigrants, painting all immigrants with a broad brush as murderers and rapists and terrible people. Um, you know, in light of that, even though I was working so hard trying to help people after President Trump got elected because it became so much harder for immigrants after that. Um, I decided that the only way to counter that, narr that narrative of, of fear mongering and painting all immigrants with one broad brush as terrible people was to try to showcase the human face of immigration. Right? delving into individual stories of wonderful people that I picked for this book who are representative of so many other thousands and hundreds of thousands and millions of immigrants to the United States. It's a, it's a large, you know, sort of uh, representation across the, the book of all the different people that are featured to give the public insight into how hardworking, how wonderful immigrants truly are and what they bring to the country, how much they have to overcome before they even get here, the stuff they're made of, the resilience, the strength, the creativity. Give they, me your tired yeah. masses yearning. I, I wanted to celebrate our common humanity and, and have people walk with each of these people through their journey to create a bond. And to show, and the only way to counter stereotypes is to tell stories. So it's a storytelling exercise. Look at each of these people and what they what they had to overcome to get here, and how incredible uh, their work is, and how much they're benefiting us, and how we, you know, we're lucky that they they're here. And so, really, the book is about a celebration, truly a celebration of immigrants. And we need to remember that we should always be a nation of immigrants. So it's an uplifting book, right, Chang? Don't you think it's an uplifting read at, at the end of the day? You go through some dark passages along the way in each person's chapter because many of the reasons they fled and came were dark reasons, you know? 
I don't want to give too much away because I hope people will buy the book and read the book. <laughs> all the proceeds are going to charity. To oh, a, good, good for you. From uh, there to here on Amazon, eh? Yeah, thank you. So, but you know, so I really mostly wanted wanted to have something for people to read that would make them feel good. And there's so much bad news these days. There's so much bad news, not just in the immigration sphere, but, you know, we wake up every day to pretty discouraging headlines. But when you pick up the book, you feel good about the country. You feel good about the principles of immigration. And, and you know that, you know, immigrants really make our well, country. I hope it, uh, by the way, somebody has got a typist nearby. And that sound is getting on our, uh, on our soundtrack. I can hear but somebody I wanted typing. to, you know, Jay, to your question, you know, how, why are, things are so hard. And I also wanted to shine a spotlight through these narratives of the downsides and the flaws and the faults in the immigration system and the way the immigration laws and the system are, is administered by different agencies. It's true, but I'd like, to, I'd like to lay an environment first, though, Susan, and that's this. Yeah. <clears throat> you know, this country with the Statue of Liberty and the, and, and the poem, um about uh, what was her name emma lazarus you yeah. know um the, the 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 great colossus i think the poem was called yes. um you know it's it's the it's the, the definition of the country and indeed you know from an economic po point of view it has made the country over a couple hundred years great um yes. and of course this isolationism nationalism xenophobia doesn't doesn't help going forward because we we lose the prospect of that going forward um, and what I what I think, though, ultimately, is a, where we, our immigration laws need to be reformed. And I'd like to ask you about that. I had a friend who served uh, as counsel in the House uh, Immigration Committee for a lifetime. And he waited and waited and waited for immigration reform. And it didn't really happen. Uh, you know, I suggest to you that we, we need that. Um, yes. But the other thing is, and, and this is really important, borders in our lifetimes in the past decade even, have been dissolving. That's before the, the migrant issue happened in Europe, but until the migrant issue happened, um, until nationalism reared its head, uh, borders were dissolving. And, and I suggest to you, Susan, that in the future, borders may dissolve even further. And we may find a, a, a borderless world. And in many ways, it appeals to me, although you know Trump's claim that, that terrible people slip in um, bottom line is that um, aren't we ultimately looking for a better world, a world without borders, a world where immigration law is very kind and gentle? Aren't we looking for that? Well, that's a very lofty and noble goal, Jay. And I agree with many of the thoughts that you just referenced. I don't think it's going to happen in our lifetime. Um, and in the meantime, we are dealing with borders and we are dealing with officers that you know, are not always very kind and don't always administer the law equally to everybody coming across the border. We have the people's fleeing from, you know, fleeing from horrific, atrocious situations where their lives and their families' lives are in danger. And while we still have the system that we have, you know, our job as lawyers is to at least try to make sure that the law is applied equitably and that when people take advantage of people that we're lucky enough to represent, that we stand up for them and we fight them tooth and nail to make sure that the constitution is upheld and their rights are protected. And you know, that includes asylum seekers, you know, and, and it's really, really important that we get the borders back to a state where people are admitted to be able to make at least make the case about why they're requesting asylum and not, you know, my short-term goals is to try to to fight for for anyone who comes to me for help and and not just on an individual basis but in a in class actions and all the federal court let you know litigation that I try to do to protect large I thought you wanted to get away from litigation Susan yeah well certain at certain times it feels pretty good <laughs> <laughs> so, I, you know I'll I'll sue the government I don't have any hesitation in suing you know the Department of Homeland Security or the president by name if necessary to make sure that my client gets what he or, he or she deserves. So are there cases, Susan, where you say to the client, you know, um, I, I don't think you're a terrible person, but you're not a good enough person that I should represent you and you'll have to go um, to someone else to help, to help you? You have those kinds of situations? Too? That's a great question, Jay. As a matter of fact, I've had some cases like that where I wasn't sure 
if the person in front of me was the kind of person that I wanted to re to represent. And, you know, as Chang alluded to, I kind of get a lot of inquiries all from people all over the world because fortunately I've developed a reputation. And sometimes I get agents uh, representing dictators contacting me. I don't take those cases, uh, as you might imagine. Uh, I once had someone who worked in the, you know, in the, the Serbian uh, Croatian war uh, in a concentration camp and swore to me that he didn't persecute or harm other people, but I wasn't sure. And I actually paid for the lie detector test of my, out of my pocket and had him take a lie detector test, which didn't, and the results didn't satisfy me. And I declined to represent that person. And, and there have been a few other people whose names I can't mention, but they're very common, well-known people who have been on the front pages and I have declined some of their cases as well. But most of the people, I try to find a way to help. I mean, if I, if I believe in them and their cause and you know, if they're hurting and they can't and they've tried everything and they've had other lawyers and no one's been able to help them, that tends to be the cases that really pull at my heartstrings. Like they only have one more shot, right? And it's either I win or God knows what will happen to that person and his or her family. So I get highly motivated to do uh, the everything. The stakes are very family. high. It's, it's really so. essentially life or death for a lot of your, your prospective clients. And I wonder how, how that, you know, how that affects your practice and your state of mind when you handle them. It's pretty stressful to handle a, a capital murder case because the fellow, you know, may be, may be executed. And, right. and that's not too far off from being sent back to a world where you will be executed. There is no stronger motivator to dot your I's and cross your T's and do everything possible in your human power to save someone when you know their life is on the line and, and it's stressful and the stress doesn't go away till you win the case. And it's stressful for them and their families and their friends, you know. So there's so many people worried, you know, all the time in this country. Um, and, you know, we just have to do the best we can. But I, uh, yeah, I get a lot of massages. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Well, I know, I, it stays just, in you, my, you, the stress, you know, the, the worry about my clients stays, resides in my, in my person. And I have to exercise it on a weekly basis. <laughs> we, 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 can, we can see. Um, before we go to Chang, I know he has questions for you. I, I do want to ask one other thing, you know. Um, back in the day, it seems my, my observation was the immigration lawyers, I mean, immigration officials, were, you know, they were pretty tough, but they, they were human being and you could talk to them and you could appeal to them and uh, they, you know, they, would, they would respond to you. Um, in Hawaii, we had a certain amount of corruption in the immigration service then known, um, but you know, by and large, they were okay to deal with. Right. Strikes me that uh, it's not just Trump, it's maybe the legacy of Trump Right now, immigration officials are really in a different world, um, and they're much tougher. Uh, they really don't care. Uh, they're not. They're not sympathetic. Um, and in fact, uh, you know, they're they're uh, they're out to throw people out of the country. That's their, um, you know, motivation. And then, of course, you have a, a skinnying down of the, of the the weapons, the tools, the kick bag that is available to the immigration lawyer. Now, how does that work? And what are your favorite mm, kit bag tools these days in order to try to help people? I think you hit the nail on the head there. Uh, there's definitely been a shift and I think it did get very much exacerbated during the Trump era because the uh, dialogue, there used to be a very uh, healthy dialogue between the immigration bar, immigration lawyers and the different agencies within DHS, you know, US Citizenship and Immigration Services, ICE and, and CBP. And there were liaison groups and we would meet on a you know regular basis and, and they'd answer questions and we'd have the ability to pick up the phone and call those people. And during Trump, he shut all of that down. And it's it's you know, the, the legacy of the Trump era is very is era is particularly severe and long, it's going to be long lasting because it takes a long time to try to undo a lot of what was done, all the harmful negative things that were done to reduce civility and connection between immigration lawyers and the people working in the agencies. Um, so, you know, I'm where I can now, I have to appeal to the highest level. And unfortunately for me, I'm lucky I have some access over years of developing it over many, you know, three plus decades. 
Um, but, you know, every time one of those very high level people that I have a good relationship with retires, it's like one less person, right, that I can go to. So I, I, um, I use the threat of media attention in a, on a very regular basis in my practice um, because, you know, so often the, uh, the ideas that some of these agents have that they would like to do shut down options for people. Um, and the human consequences of their, you know, uh, uncaring attitude and even disregard of the actual requirements under the policy and the law sometimes um, can only be countered with the threat of, uh, you know, a big spread in the news about what the consequences would be. Right now I have a family I'm trying to help, um, three kids. and. Uh, Unfortunately for them, both their parents who were on the visas that were keeping them here illegally, both tragically died within a year of each other, leaving some teenage kids, three orphan kids. And, you know, I'm trying to get a special status for those kids. And uh, it's called deferred action. And it will, you know, give them a chance to get back on their feet and, and mourn and grieve and be with the community that they found. And if the government doesn't grant it, that's, that's going to be a story in the newspaper to try to make them do the right thing. You know, that's all you can do. Sometimes but, you have well, to use that, the But that works. <clears throat> and I guess um, even in these difficult times, there is a, a readership, <clears throat> a readership out there who reads that media report and who finds it objectionable um, and would, you know, would, would, would sympathize with, with the uh, immigrant. I hope yes. there is. Yes, and you can galvanize a lot of public support, which can go a long way. And I've done that a lot in my career you know, leading campaigns of public support to try to help save an immigrant who deserves to be saved and not kicked out of the country. But, you know, it's yeah. case by case, it's case by case. And, you know, I had, a, I think I describe it in the epilogue of my book. One of my partners served in the Bush administration at a very high level in a very key department, executive agency of the, of the federal government, American citizen. And he was traveling across the border between Mexico and Texas, and he observed uh, a Customs and Border Protection officer mistreating the woman in line in front of him. And he spoke up for the woman and he said to the guy, you really should speak to people in a nicer way. You're representing the United States. You're the first you know, face of the US that anyone sees. And you, know, you should treat everyone with kindness and respect. And the guy took my, my partner, who's a senior partner in a corporate law firm, and he took him into secondary inspection. He said, you can't talk to me like that. And he stripped him of his global entry. He took his global entry away. It was a complete abomination, you know, abuse of discretion by a Customs and Border Protection agent. And my partner's a powerful guy, a very powerful lawyer. And CBP just, you know, basically, you know, took this, uh, this, this right that he had, which he was entitled to, which he had earned and, and applied for under legitimate process, took it away in a second. Right? You would think something like that would happen in third, third world country, right? Not in the United States. So fortunately for this guy, I mean, I, he knew me and I, I was able to go to the head of the global, you know, global entry department in Washington, DC, and they were horrified that it happened. But, and it took still, it took like four to six weeks to overturn the denial and get it reinstated. You know, like what do other people do, you know? That's an so, awful story. You got to call it out when you see it. That's the thing. That's really you got, you got to talk truth to power, um, and and fairness and equity to power. And, yes. and you know, it's a great concern to me. And I'm going to turn this over to Chang now. Is that over time these stories have a way of permeating the global environment, and uh, where we used to see the Statue of Liberty and all that it stood for, uh, now we see this this hard nosed. Uh, grossly unfair immigration service uh, that, that almost enjoys dumping on people. This is very troubling, not only to the people involved and to right-thinking citizens, but to the whole world. Our image has been tarnished uh, by the emergence of these new strains you're talking about, or old strains come current. But let me go to Chang. Chang, I know you have questions, so I'm turning this witness over to you. Uh Remember two years ago, I interviewed you for a BBC article on immigration. And you talked about the immigration status at that time. And at that time, it was very, not very promising because uh, a 
a year ago, Donald Trump administration just removed, rewrote the entire United States Citizenship and Immigration Services, USCIS, the mission statement. In the original mission statement, the agents, USCIS, uh, was serving a nation of immigrants. And, but uh, USAIS removed that sentence. That sentence is not simply a body, it's a very large implication. But the, uh, the good news is that recently, ASIAS reporting that USAIS leadership is, is asking all of its employees uh, to describe the immigration agency's mission in three words to help them to rewrite the mission. Not reverting back to the original, but to a new mission state. If you were a USAIS officer, so what words would you like? Yeah, it's it was horrifying to me when that happened. And the, the saddest thing is that I know the guy who ended up take, rewriting the mission statement. I was very disappointed in him um, when he did that because they took away the reference to the nation of immigrants and they also took out the word customer. And, you know, they just don't, uh, and like Jay was saying, it, the removal of terms that connote respect just is, is, you know, an indicator of a lack of caring and lack of concern and a lack of respect for immigrants, right? And that changing of the mission statement was a reflection of an America first, very nativist sort of orientation around immigration. But the United States always will be a nation of immigrants. I mean, right now, there's 43 million people in the United States that were born in another country. We are a nation of immigrants and we must always be a nation of immigrants. So the way I would rewrite the mission statement, I would, um, I don't think three words are enough. <laughs> I don't think you can rewrite the mission statement with just three words, but I would think maybe maybe two or three sentences. Um, and if it were up to me, it would be something like um, that USCIS is committed to ensuring that the United States remains a nation of immigrants and to providing immigration benefits fairly with transparency, equal access to all, and, you know, in in an equitable manner and efficiently, efficiently. Don't forget, it, it, it was due concern for human values. Don't forget. Yes, and and you know, there's so much inefficiency in in the system, and it's there's so much carelessness in the system. So, I think the mission statement needs to reflect an attitude that immigrants are people too. They deserve. Any of us could be in a heartbeat in a situation where an immigrant to another country. We have to put ourselves in other people's shoes. So it really has to come down to almost like a biblical notion, you know, do unto others as you would wish people would do to, you know, to and for you, like be, treat other people the way you would want to be treated. But, you know, that's kind of simplistic for the mission statement. So I would use some of the other language that I gave you, you know, but if efficiency is a problem, like the things are taking forever now to get approved and employment authorization cards went from 90 days pre-Trump now, even with Biden as president, having a lot of trouble getting the processing times back to normal amounts of time so people can live with. It's from 90 days, it's like eight to 10 months to get an employment card now. You know, citizenship applications are taking a year and a half. It used to take, you know, five to six months. It's out well, of- Why is that, Susan? It sounds like a, a, a culture point within the immigration service. Uh, it sounds like- um... Well, you know, a change in attitude that isn't going away anytime soon. It's I think it's a perfect storm between, you know, the legacy of the Trump era era where, you know, they, they took a lot of people out of service and then COVID hit. And then the you know, the backlogs grew exponentially as the, due to the combination of both of those things. But providing more officers to the different adjudication lines is really, really important, but not charging people more. People pay enough. For these applications they pay enough that they should get efficient and not careless service from the government and they deserve it yeah. okay yes agree <laughs> well um you know susan you know um, talk about immigration reform now it's more complex than when my buddy served as counsel for the house immigration committee 
yeah. um, because of the you know the you know the process the dynamic you've described. Um, and I wonder, you know, how the president, in a right-thinking administration, could fix that because it sounds to me like there are people that populate the ranks, including high ranks in the immigration service, that are perpetuating, um, you know, these very serious human rights problems there, and and uh, the failure to abide by the law, uh, fa failure to follow the rule of law is what yeah. we have. And, and there are a lot of officers in the immigration service who need to be reminded of that. But what, what does the president do? What can the president do? What should the president do? The president sets the tone for the, for the service, for the Department of Homeland Security, and for the country. And the president can actually do a lot. It's, you know, I think Biden has good intentions, but it, there's so many things that have to be fixed that his attention is being divided. But there's some easy fixes, easy things that he could do. For example, why is it the case that every time someone applies for an immigration benefit, they have to get their fingerprints taken again and again and again? Do people's fingerprints change over time? No. One fingerprinting is enough to run any number of background checks over the number of years that someone has applications pending. And it takes so much longer to process those fingerprints than it used to, and the background checks have slowed down. And so that's one of the reasons why things, you know, all these applications are taking so long. So you should never make anyone get fingerprinted more than once. It's easy. Why do we need to have in-person interviews for a lot of immigration benefits when everything's already been vetted behind the scenes through security checks and the information has been reviewed? Used to be that we didn't need in-person interviews, and then Biden came along and reinstated in-person interviews, and the Trump and I mean Trump did that and Biden hasn't changed it back yet. But that's something easy. He could direct the officers to adjudicate the cases on the papers and for the most part, except where there's a concern about fraud or a problem, then they want to interview the person, you know, sitting down in an office. But most of the time, uh, benefits can be adjudicated without an interview. The same thing can happen outside the country at embassies and consulates, you know, especially for for you know, renewals of someone's visa where they've already been approved once, there really shouldn't be a need to make people to go back in person to an embassy. And those backlogs are like up to a year now, year and a half in some countries because of COVID delays. Just to apply for a visitor visa in some countries, you've got to wait a year to get an appointment. That's ridiculous. You know, but you don't, you shouldn't need to go in person for a lot of these things. So that's something he could do. Sensitivity training for the officers, I think would be really important. And some of us, me included, are advocating that there should be some kind of a pilot program where um, there's watchdogs at the airports and the borders, keeping an eye on the transactions that are happening between the CBP officers and people coming across. Someone looking over their shoulder to make them do the right thing so that they don't abuse their power. Um, it can become quite power hungry when no one is looking and that's when a lot of bad abuses happen. So we, we need to have some kind of a pilot program to institute some kind of monitoring of that. Well, what about monitoring for, um, you know, meanness uh, and, and um, you know, inappropriate actions on applications and uh, exercise of, uh, of rampant power just for the sake of being mean and all that? An attitudinal problem that uh, surfaced uh, and was exacerbated uh, while Trump was in office, which he welcomed, which he encouraged. Yes, um, can't we go the other way on that and say, look, you're going to be rated um, on how how kind you are. You're going to be rated on <laughs> on whether you stand for the principles of this country or not. And if you don't, your career will be affected, your promotion will be affected, and uh, you may lose your job. Um, uh, we need sanctions in order to reverse the attitudinal decline, don't you think? I think it's a really interesting idea, Jay. I think in practice, it's going to be difficult to achieve that because, you know, there are a lot of officers who are embedded in the agencies that don't feel the same way that you do and I do. Um, and so it's going to take a long time to transition people out and bring in new, fresh faces and people who believe in those principles to enforce those kinds of actions. Right? So it's got to come from the top. You know, if your boss does, looks the other way, nothing is going to happen. So, you know, we, we need to hold them accountable, I think, in a variety of ways, not just internally 
inside the agencies because you don't really trust that it's always going to happen the right way if that happens. But those of us who are watching, we need to be vocal. We need to call out problems when we see them. We need to write op-eds and newspaper articles, uh, uh, you know, blog posts to show the world when things go wrong and shame people into, you know, being better uh, and treating people with the respect and dignity that they deserve. Um, because otherwise it's just going to keep spiraling down and getting worse. So, you know, those of us who are immigration lawyers and, you know, in the business of representing clients through the immigration practice, we all have an obligation to take it a step further for people when we need to. And that's what I do when I see it. I go to the district director and, and the district director in, in any city, you know, oftentimes has, has the same, um, ideals that I do and is horrified when he or she hears that one of the officers has acted out of line. So there's sometimes a big disconnect, you know, so they need to treat a lot of internal trainings. And I think sensitivity training is very important. It's going to happen. I can't tell you if it's really going to happen that way. Well, it strikes me after all that we've said and what I've heard from other immigration lawyers is that it's harder to practice immigration law these days because of the resistance you get to a clear case, which you know you feel legally is a clear case, and the immigration service uh, through these personnel are likely to reject that notion and make it as hard as they can for you. And of course, the, you know the human rights issues on the border and all that. It's harder to represent these people, and also these people don't have a lot of money. They never had a lot of money uh, coming into Ellis Island. You know, they they might have had five dollars. Um, right. And now the same five dollars. So right. The question I put to you is: um, Do immigration lawyers these days make any money? Are you making any money? Uh, can you get rich being an immigration lawyer, or is it all for love? That is a question I'm going to choose not to answer. <laughs> but <laughs> I, um, I have to say that I. I can't imagine have had, having had a more fulfilling career than the one I've had helping people, you know, to to actually achieve their American dreams, no matter how hard the process sometimes is. I can't imagine anything more fulfilling, more rewarding, no matter how hard it is. Um, making a difference in someone's life, oftentimes the difference between life and death. And the, it's just a privilege for me. It's a privilege for me to, to, to meet all my clients from all parts of the world. So many interesting places and their cultures are fascinating. I learn and gain so much from them. And they're making the country so much better in a palpable way. And I'd, I'm so proud of them. And I feel so lucky that they're my clients. You know, most of my clients, I just absolutely love. And, and I want the world to see how immigrant by immigrant and person by person, these people are making our country great. And I, for one, couldn't be more proud of that. Well, we couldn't be more proud of you. <laughs> what you are doing is national service. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So, Jan, can you summarize and, and uh, thank Susan and uh, close the show? Absolutely. Thank you, Jay. Thank you so much. So, I, I highly recommend everybody read the book, Journey from There to Here. There the is. You just read these stories, you'll be proud to be American. And you feel pain and suffering, and but you also feel joy and celebrate with these immigrants. I'm an immigrant. And may I quote President Obama, and when I read, when I review Susan's book on Amazon, if there's anyone out there who still thought that America is a place where all the things are possible, who still wonders if the dream of our founders is alive in our time, who still question whether America is a nation of immigrants, Susan Cohen's book, Journey from There to Here, is your answer. I want to thank you, Susan, again, and for, you, for, you, for all your wonderful work and effort to help the immigrants pro bono work, working with the ACLU and the PAR and all these charities. And you are my role model. I know it's very hard. It's, in, it's almost impossible to achieve your level as a lawyer, as an uh, immigrant attorney. 
and uh, who is also an immigrant and who teach constitutional law and immigration law. And I just uh, learned so much from all of you parties, you just uh, uh, valuable advice in your book. And uh, Jay, you are always my role model for years. But, uh, uh, the, the, the love and the passion, you are uh, what we call a compassionate journalist who would really you know, value journalism and help uh, the community. Thank you both. Thank you, Chang. Thank you, Susan. Thank you so great much. Discussion. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Same here. Bye-bye. Aloha.